Um, so I will keep this, um, I'll keep this quite short, hopefully, and, and a little bit light. So I'm going to talk about being a beast machine. I've put in this and other business because I decided I wanted to just introduce a few of the new experimental directions that, that I and other people in the lab, people who are here, have started to work on, uh, kind of associated with the EXPECT project, um, led by Andy, of course. There's also um, one of these projects is a time perception project uh, supported by another EU project, Timestorm. So a lot of the work, common thread for a lot of the work we're doing is all about the brain basis of consciousness. That's been a prominent theme in this meeting too. And just to sort of orient you, um, the way I like to think about studying consciousness is not in terms of solving the hard problem that we've heard about a lot, but it's rather to identify different dimensions or aspects of conscious experience and try to find mechanisms that explain the relevant phenomenology in these different dimensions or aspects. So typically I divide things into you know, how conscious you are, the difference between general anesthesia and conscious wakefulness, conscious content, what you're conscious of when you are conscious, and conscious self, a specific part of conscious content that has to do with the experience of being you or being me, the experience of being someone. And um, trying to understand the, the differences in phenomenology between these different aspects of, of consciousness. I'm not going to talk about level today, I'm going to talk about content and self through the framework, and we heard a lot about this as well, of predictive coding, the free energy principle, basically perception as resulting from top-down predictions that uh, that minimise sensory prediction errors, that are sort of predictions about the hidden causes of sensory signals in one way or another. Um, this is the sort of nice summary diagram of one version of a process theory of, of predictive processing or free energy principle where predictions flow, the blue arrows flow from the top down and are met by ascending sensory signals, prediction errors from the bottom up from the bottom up, which allows the brain to minimise these prediction errors, form its best guess of the causes of sensory signals, and that's what we consciously perceive, and all this is nicely uh, weighted and orchestrated by precisions and precision expectations which balance the relative influence of predictions and prediction errors. So this is all kind of familiar stuff. The contention is it's not only about inferring the causes of things out there in the world, like tomatoes, but also the hidden causes of things that are self-related, things that have to do with being a body, with having a body, with volition, with intention, with first-person perspective, with all those other aspects that we associate selfhood with. Um, where I'll end up at the end of this talk is, and this refers to some of the material that, that those who were here yesterday will, we would have discussed, which is what is really the, the, the difference between the phenomenology of the outside world and the phenomenology of being a self. You know, the self doesn't feel like an object apart from when I look at my body as an object in, in the world. This, there are some very basic non-object-like experiences of being a body. And uh, Wanya was talking about this as, as inference directed at different kinds of salience objects. I think, or I'd like, I'm trying to explore the idea that it's more to do with what predictions are used for. If pre perceptual predictions are used to find out what's there, we have a kind of object-related phenomenology, but when predictions are used to control or regulate things, um, we have a kind of non-object-related phenomenology that reflects how well or how badly that control is going, which seems to me to be much closer to things like mood, emotion, and the sort of basic experience of just being an organism. Um, so that's where we're going to end up, and that's why the title of the talk is actually called Being a Beast Machine, because it emphasises this basic aspect of embodied selfhood as being deeply rooted in our nature as flesh and blood, living, breathing organisms. Um, so that's all the important stuff. That's actually the take-home message. Now, for the rest of the talk, sort of a little bit of inversion of Carl. Now I'll move straight on to the, the sort of light entertainment bit and talk about some of the experiments that we've been doing under this rubric. Oh, I meant to, this is the sort of summary statement. Uh, embodied selfhood depends on control-oriented predictive models of the causes of sensory signals across interoceptive, extraceptive, and proprioceptive domains. Now, an important thing about predictive processing, predictive coding, free energy principle, whichever expression of these set of ideas that you think about, they're not theories of consciousness. They're either very much more general than that, as in the free energy principle, or they are kind of specific mechanisms for how the brain might do perception, action, cognition. But there's nothing like, say, integrated information theory, which is a theory of consciousness. It says that consciousness is, you know, phi, or some kind of you know, version of phi. Um, now, this might seem to be a disadvantage of trying to understand consciousness because it's not a theory of consciousness. I actually think it's, 
It's an advantage, I think. This is, the fact that it's not a theory of consciousness is why it's a terrific theory for doing consciousness science, because you don't assume from the outset the answer. Rather, what you've got is a very sophisticated set of bridging principles that will help you move from mechanism to phenomenology. So you can do better than just looking at you know, what correlates, the typical thing of looking for neural correlates of consciousness. You can now start to begin to account for the properties of phenomenology with the, the concepts, computational and conceptual, that are provided by this way of thinking. So I think it's actually a really, really useful thing that it's not a theory of consciousness. Um, so the menu for the next 25 minutes uh, I'm just going to run through a series of studies that we have either sort of finalising or in progress, um, just to give you a sense of what some of the things that we're doing, we're doing now. Uh, and these experiments are kind of loosely connected. This has a disadvantage that if you're expecting a really strong narrative leading all the way through to a final ultimate conclusion, you'll be disappointed. But if you fall asleep at any point, it doesn't really matter because the next experiment will be, you can start from scratch and it should make sense. So I'll talk about the hallucination machine, simulating hallucin hallucinogenic phenomenology, um, some stuff about objecthood and presence, counterfactuals and sensory motor contingencies. Now, Seems like most people today have been telling me I'm going to talk about this later in great depth, but I'm not going to talk about the detailed mathematics of counterfactual inference later because Carl and Wanya talked about it earlier. Um, then I'll talk about intentional inference, so intentional binding without intentions. Um, and then a little excursion into time perception. So how, does, how do we do time perception? Time, I think, is a really interesting and, and under kind of I think it deserves a lot more thinking about, a lot more attention. We, when we think about perceptual inference, if we think about vision and audition, well, there are at least sensory signals that have you know, the corresponding modalities, but time is very different. You know, we don't have time sensors in the brain, and prevailing theories seem to think that we have a sort of clock in the brain, which is a bit of a strange way to go about it, I think. So we'll, um, we'll get to clockless time, and then we'll finish back where we started with being a beast machine. Now, all of these different topics are related by this way of thinking about perception and its phenomenological expression in, through the lens of predictive processing. So uh, I also just want to, a lot of people have been involved in this work, but I really wanted to highlight Kesuke Suzuki, who's here, and Warwick Roseboom, who is not here. Uh, most of these experiments I'll, I just mentioned were led by, by them, so really grateful to them. So the hallucination machine, I wanted to show this uh, because many of you will have already seen the video. In fact, Baba showed the video uh, yesterday. But what can you do with it? I'll, if you didn't see the video, you'll see it again in a second. Um, so if you think about perception as prediction, one obvious uh, implication of that is a way to understand visual hallucinations as overactive perceptual predictions that are under-constrained by sensory prediction errors. They overwhelm the sensory prediction errors so that we see things that are not there. Of course, we all see things that are not there. It's just usually we agree about the things uh, that are not there, and so we don't realise that they're not there. Um, so here's you know, a sort of caricature of a hallucination. Um, to simulate, to try to induce hallucinations in normal people without giving them uh, drugs or mental illness, we, use, we turn to deep uh, convolutional neural networks. And we heard about Deep Dream earlier from, from Marta. So this is actually... This is a, a sort of standard deep convolutional network that's run in a purely feedforward direction. So it has an image, and then it, partition, it sort of has many layers of, of feedforward connections. Uh, some signals flow up through these connections, and, and the top layer will do some sort of object recognition about what's in the image. So this is a purely feedforward network trained, in this case, to distinguish different kinds of dogs and cats and so on. The deep dream algorithm, as we heard briefly, runs things backwards. So what you do is you clamp um, part of the network and then you update the image so that you minimize that you basically do back propagation on the image so that the image matches what the network thinks is there. Now this is a sort of a very brute force implementation of the idea of, perception, of hallucination as overactive prediction because there's no generative model going on here. We're sort of kind of approximating the idea of a generative model by clamping a feedforward network and running it backwards and changing the image. But nonetheless, you get these very strange and very compelling uh, results. It's as if the network is expecting to see dogs everywhere. And here, of course, is um, Kesuke's now rather famous uh, depiction of 
Sussex campus on a Tuesday afternoon uh, full of dogs. And this is, um, I think when Barbara showed it yesterday, it was just a sort of still frame. This just shows that you know, what we've done is, is process a whole panoramic video through this algorithm. So when you view this through a head-mounted display, and it has sound too, it's really very uh, compelling and immersive. You can, you can look all around you and, and see you know, there are dogs in the sky as well. Uh, there's some there, the dog in the sky. Um, so this, of course, is fun, but uh, you know, one of the things with VR, one of the worries is, it, is it's very easy, or well, it's not very easy, it's very difficult, Kesseke makes it very easy. It's very difficult to do things um, that are fun, or very, but then how do you, you know, what do you do with them when you've got them? And we thought that, you know, we started this project as a way of just, can we, parameter, you, can we simulate hallucinogenic phenomenology in a parameterizable way? So one thing you can do is you can clamp other layers. So this is what happens if you clamp a sort of middle layer of a deep network and impose it on the image. Now you, you see kind of dog parts rather than dogs um, coming out. And this, this is kind of interesting because if you, if you think about the sorts of things that people report in psychosis or under uh, various psychedelic drugs, they vary. Some are very complex and object-based. Others are very sort of geometric and, and low-level. So this provides a way to try to figure out you know, where the action is in perceptual networks that might underpin these phenomenologically distinct kinds of hallucinations. So that's, that's one thing that we can do. But what we actually did in, in the first experiment with this stuff was, was very simple. We just took people, we put them, we gave them the head-mounted display. They experienced the, uh, the Sussex campus movie for a while um, or the control movie where they, where they just saw it without the deep dream processing. And then we asked them a series of standard questions from one of these altered states of consciousness questionnaires. Um, you know, do you, was your thinking muddled? Were you losing control of your mind? Please rate the intensity of the experience and so on. And just, just as a sort of reality check, Probably not the right word to use reality check in this context. Um, you can plot people's responses uh, on these questionnaires on a sort of spider plot like this, where the further out it is, the more strongly they rate that dimension. And you can see here that people's ratings of their experience within the hallucination machine overlap pretty closely with people's ratings. These are different people in a separate study uh, when they're under the influence of psilocybin. So there's kind of a, a close match there. Uh, as compared to this is now within subjects, uh, the people in the machine and in the control condition. So this is sort of at least suggestive that we are managing to capture some of the phenomenologically relevant aspects of um, psychedelic experience through this sort of virtual reality or really altered reality simulation. We also looked at time judgments because there's been quite a lot of uh, evidence suggesting that people's judgments of duration are altered in the psychedelic state. We don't know why that is. Is that because their perception is different or is that because you know, something else is going on that, that interferes with their estimation of time? So we asked them, we basically trained them to pair particular tones with durations and then, and, and it's an interval production task here, so they would be given a tone then have to produce the required interval. And um, what we find is no difference between the control and the hallucination machine here. So they do this during the experience, so that you know, it's, it's happening all the time. They try to reproduce the interval, and basically they reproduce intervals equally inaccurately. I mean, they're not accurate particularly, but um, they don't show any difference between the two conditions. So we don't see a corresponding alteration in time perception in the same way that people alter their subjective reports of what's going on. There's an interesting dissociation there. Um, we are also experimenting with other ways of inducing non-pharmacological hallucinations and doing the same thing. This is work by David Schwartzman, also in the lab, uh, using very high-powered strobe lights that flicker at about 10 hertz. You sit in front of them, you close your eyes, and you have a weird time as well. You will, pretty much everybody starts to experience colors, shapes, and even very complex scenes that are just not there in the stimulus. It is just a white flashing light. And uh, again, we can play the same game, but also with this, we can quite easily record um, EEG and so on. So that's, that's ongoing work. As I said, this is really just a taster session of some of these studies, so that's all I have to say about that, just that this, this method provides a way of simulating, parameterizing non-pharmacological well, non hallucinogenic phenomenology. There was too many long words for me to get that sentence right. Um, sort of uh, implementing the idea of hallucinations as overactive perceptual predictions. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is a, a quite... A, Experiments have been going on for quite a long time, trying to get at this idea of the phenomenology of objecthood and presence. And this is where these counterfactual predictions come in within predictive processing. Um, 
Perceptual presence can be thought of. This is, goes back to, um, well, Alvin Noe and Kevin O'Regan. Oh, they're on the next slide quoted. But um, it's really the idea, sorry, that when in vision, when I look around me, the world does seem to be full of objects. And if I look at an object in front of me, here's the kind of classic example. I look at a cup. I perceive it as having a back and sides. Even if the back is not directly available to my eyes, I still somehow perceive it as being there um, in a way uh, that is not true if I see a picture of a cup or a picture of a pipe. Of course, this is the, this is the intuition that Magritte has played with in his famous The Treachery of Images. You know, it's not a pipe, it's an image of a pipe. You look at an image of something, you don't perceive that it has a back or a side. It's not perceived as an object. Uh, this is a very sort of subtle but pervasive aspect of phenomenology that's very easy to take for granted, but of course it's not always there, and that's why it's interesting. In synesthesia, for example, in graphene colour synesthesia, people experience colours when they see achromatic letters, and they don't always experience them on the letter. This is actually a, a, a poor depiction of what the phenomenology of synesthesia is like, because they still see the letter as black, it's just they have an additional experience of colour. But critically, they don't experience the colour as being out there in the real world. It lacks the kind of perceptual presence that a real coloured letter has. Um, so perceptual presence is a dimension of phenomenology that can be selectively added or subtracted uh, from our experiences of the world. So how to explain that? Well, an old sort of set of ideas from sensory motor contingency theory suggests that presence results from the implicit knowledge of sensory motor contingencies that govern how sensory signals respond to actions. I perceive the back of the cup even if I don't directly see it because my brain has mastered how it would respond were I to move around it or rotate it. So therefore, it's kind of, it, you know, I kind of somehow potentially see the back so I perceive it as having a back. The problem with sensory motor contingency theory is that it provides absolutely no mechanism for how this might happen, and that's where uh, predictive processing and more specifically active inference comes in. Um, this is Carl's slide of active inference, the idea that we can minimise prediction errors either by changing our predictions or by making actions to change our sensations. I recently came across a song by 1980s English post-punk band The The, who summarise this idea beautifully, if you can't change the world, change yourself, which they sing six times, and then they finish with, and if you can't change yourself, then change your world, which is you know, a beautiful expression of active inference. Um, I also find, I don't know about you, but he looks like a young Tononi to me, which, which I worry about. Um, so active inference, as Carl explained, if you're going to change your world to admit to minimise prediction error, well, you have to know how your actions are going to affect your sensory signals. You have to have a model of ma what making a particular action is going to do to your sensory signals. Otherwise, you just randomly change your sensory signals. You're not going to minimise anything. So it's in this sense that active inference implies, formally, the ability to generate conditional or counterfactual predictions based on a, model of the current, based on a generative model of the hidden causes of your current sensory signals. So that, to me, operationalises this idea of the mastery of sensory motor contingencies, that if you have a model that's able to generate a rich repertoire of counterfactual predictions, well, it's one that has mastered the relevant set of sensory motor contingencies. So there's a long and quite uh, overly long and dull paper I wrote about this seven years ago, and um, what you can do with that sort of conceptual machinery is account for a lot of variations of perceptual presence in different kinds of conscious states, such as lucid dreaming, synesthesia, different kinds of hallucinations, and so on. But rather than go through that, I wanted to, again, get to the experiment, because how do you test an idea like that? How do you go around and manipulate the kinds of sensory motor contingencies or counterfactual predictions that you might bring to bear on a situation? So again, we turn to virtual reality, and here the idea uh, that we can use augmented reality to invent virtual objects that behave in different ways when you interact with them. So here's an object that behaves pretty much as a normal object would. Of course, it's an unfamiliar object. Don't know anything about it. Uh, here is an object that behaves like the moon. It always gives you the same face, no matter what you do. Uh, so that's kind of a strange situation. And here's one which behaves when you move with respect to it or interact with it, but it behaves in a very odd and unnatural way. We'll come back to that in a second. So the idea was, how would people's perception of the object change after interacting with it in these different sorts of ways? You can only really do this in, in VR. Um, we had to simplify things quite a lot for the actual experiment. 
Another challenge with VR things is the more interesting and naturalistic you make them, the harder they are to control. So it's really hard to hit that sweet spot. So what we did here uh, was set up a system where people could rotate um, these real-world cogs in one way or another. That changed, that rotated this AR marker, and you'll see that change that moves um, the virtual objects either in a congruent or an incongruent way. Um, so, it, and we use a continuous flash suppression method, which is subject to various criticisms, I, I know, but we use it anyway for, in this first study. And the question is, when people are interacting so that the object behaves as you would expect it to, as a normal object, does it break through, break, break through CFS faster? So this isn't a direct question about presence, but it's, it's still looking for an, uh, something that we can measure about uh, the conscious perception of this object. And what we find is kind of interesting that um, it doesn't actually matter in this experiment whether the object rotates in the right way, in the same way that you're rotating the thing or not, but it does matter that the rotation is coupled to your hand movements. If you replay a, a different trial, then it takes a lot longer to break through. Um, but if it's a live interaction, even if it's incongruent, it breaks through faster. And I think this is, this is still something we're thinking about, but I, it's an interesting result because uh, one criticism of these sorts of experiments, they're subject to response bias, that you more, must, might be more likely just to you know, um, respond in one condition than another. But this difference between live and replay and the fact we don't see it between congruent and incongruent is kind of interesting in that, in that context. We also have a second study um, where we use a manipulandum thing. This is called a geomagic touch thing. We can have this pen thing move around, so we allow people to move the object much more freely. Um, and it's again, it's behind this, this Mondrian thing, and it will break, there's the object, it will break through at some point. And again, we measure the difference, how long it takes to break through um, when it's, uh, it's moving as it, as it should do, uh, when you replay a previous trial, or when it doesn't move at all. And again, when it moves as it should do, it breaks through faster. So there's something about the way you interact with these objects that's affecting, in this case, how easily you can consciously see uh, the object. We did try a bunch of other things to more directly measure conscious presence, like estimate the amount of visual noise that you see when you, when you see a still picture of the object, but those didn't work so well. Um, so I said contingency rather than congruency models break through time, and it's still not direct measure of perceptual presence, but it's another example of using VR to try to ask a, a kind of non-trivial phenomenological question. Now, the third thing, intentional inference. There's a poster uh, about this uh, with Kesuke outside, so you can follow up more on this in the, in the poster session. But this is another aspect of, in this case, getting closer to the self that, that we think is also amenable to a kind of predictive perception explanation. You know, the, the, when we experience volition and agency over things, uh, um, what's going on? What explains why, we, why do we feel agency in some cases and not in other cases? Uh, what, what constrains that? It's tempting sometimes to think there's something special about experiences of volition and agency. They, they depend in some privileged way on, let's say, motor reference copies or motor intention signals. Another possibility is just causal inference, but and, and motor intention signals, whatever they are, play a part, but only and not an essential part in experiences, something we have agency over. And that's the idea we wanted to, to explore here. And we use this paradigm, which is very well known now from Patrick Haggard long ago. Uh, this is a review called Intentional Binding. And for those of you who don't, uh, does everybody hands up who, who's familiar with intentional binding? Most of you, but not, by, not about two thirds. Um, so if you're asked to judge, if, you, if there's an action, like you press a button and then there's 250 milliseconds, a short delay, and then a tone. That's the objective time between these things. Uh, it turns out if, you're, if the action is reliably followed by the tone and you're asked to judge the duration between the action and the tone, you will judge it as being reliably shorter than it really is. That is called intentional binding, and it's taken as a sort of independent behavioral measure of the feeling of agency. When you feel that you've caused the outcome, you experience the action and the tone, the, the effect and the, uh, the, con the, the action and the consequence as bound together in time. And two things happen. The action timing, the judgment of your timing of the action is drawn towards the tone, and your judgment of the timing of the tone is drawn back towards the action. So you have this, these, sort of pers these perspective and retrospective effects. Um, so that's, that's intentional binding. And 
there are two sort of basic ideas how this might come about. The first is perspective. So you have some sort of efferent motor signals that come out when you make the action. They're compared with the sensory consequences of, of your actions later on. And there's a, what you might call a retrospective account, where feelings of agency and intentional binding just depend on post hoc inferences about the relevant sensory causes, whatever they might be. And we wanted to ask a question, can we distinguish these accounts, and specifically, can we get intentional binding without any intention? Because if we can do that, it's not really intentional binding at all. And um, so again, we use VR to try to pull apart some of these conditions in a novel way. So we have an active condition. People have a virtual hand here, and they can press a button. Now, in the active condition, they have multiple sources of information about the sequence of events. They can see their virtual hands, when they press the virtual button, they get a tactile feedback. There's a little buzzer attached to their, um, their finger. They're making the action, so whatever counts as motor intention, it's there. And their hand actually moves as well as the virtual hand, so they're proprioceptive information as well. So there's a lot of causes, a lot of potential information about the action uh, that, that, that you can have. And of course, then there's the outcome, which in this case is a tone, so you have auditory information there. There's a passive case, and in this case, the person just sees the button be pushed, it, the button pushes itself, but they feel the tactile stimulus, and then the outcome happens. Now there's no, they don't move their real hands, and the virtual hand also doesn't move. So it's just the button gets pushed, and the outcome happens. And in the third condition, which is the sort of interesting one, it's fake. So they don't move their hand, but now the virtual hand moves and pushes the button, they still feel the touch, and the outcome happens. So we can begin to separate, we can selectively remove this kind of um, proprioceptive and intention from the possible set of inference, influences on intentional binding. So this is what it looks like. Uh, they do the whole, this is again Kesseke, uh, this is all kind of advert for his work really. Um, we do the whole experiment in VR, so people read the instructions in it, they start the thing, and here they, uh, so here we go, they press this virtual button, and um, you can just, there's a tight little sound there, and then they, there was a tone, and they enter. It sounds weird to just type it into a keypad, but people get quite good at that if you give them a bit of practice. Um, so that's the active condition. It's also the same as the, in the fake condition is simply that they're not moving their real hand. In the passive condition, you just see a button press, and um, press itself, and then you estimate the time. So those are the conditions. Now, the, what happens, and this is still ongoing work, this doesn't look very impressive, but actually, uh, so this, we, we tried three different intervals, so 200 milliseconds, 400, 800 of, between the button press and the tone, and people judge that interval. So for longer intervals, they judge the, the duration is longer. That's, that's what you expect. So that's the reality check, again, a virtual reality check, you should call it. Um, but what's, if you just contrast, if you run a, a Bayesian and over on this, what you get is that there's strong evidence of a difference in the judgment of duration between active and passive. So that's basically the intentional binding effect. They judge the things as duration is shorter when they make the movement uh, than when the button presses itself. But there is evidence of no difference between active and fake. That, that's to say we get pretty much the same magnitude of intentional binding even when people don't move their hands. So intentional binding in this paradigm doesn't require intention. So what's going on? It's not really intentional binding. It's um, sort of just post hoc inference about the most relevant set of causes. Now there is, I should say, a worry about the thing we've done so far. Because it's done in virtual reality, people just might not pay attention to their motor intentions. So we need to do some other stuff to account for that. But it's still a nice, I think, sort of way of teasing apart things that you wouldn't normally be able to tease apart. And it's compatible with this idea of aspects of conscious selfhood as just being another form of causal inference. So, uh, how long have I got? I've got very little time, five minutes or so. I wanted to say a few things about time, since I mentioned it at the beginning. This is, this is work by, by Warwick Roseby, and again, it's showing that the mechanisms that underlie a common way we perceive the world, and time is also arguably a component of how we experience being a self as well, you know, the unfolding of time, since it's not out there in the world. Most prevailing models of time perception postulate some kind of clock in the head. The most um, sophisticated of these these days are things called the striatal beat frequency model. Because if you think about judgments of time over, let's say, a few seconds, it's very hard to think, well, what would be the biological process that would provide a clock that ticks at you know, seconds or half seconds? But if you've got oscillators that sort of oscillate at neuronally plausible frequencies, 
but different ones close together, you'll get beat frequencies, that wow, wow type thing that you have when you have two tones, you know, out of tune guitar or something. Maybe those beat frequencies give you the oscillator by which you measure time. But these seem to me to be a little, and Warwick, who's, who's led this work, seem to be a little bit like epicycles in you know, explanations of the solar system and so on. It's just adding complication where you don't need any because it's probably ideas that we, we do time because we've got a clock in the head seem overly homuncular to me. You know, we want to not have a clock in the head to understand time. Um, and so what we've done here, and again, this is work that's completely led by Warwick Roseby, is, the, is try to think of time perception as an inference on perceptual dynamics without any clock at all. Uh, so, there, so we want a non-clock, a clock-free model of time perception that works for natural images. So what uh, we did, we used another of these deep convolutional neural networks. It's AlexNet, recognizes objects. We show it natural videos. And the idea is that at each level of the network, um, there could be a, a change a salient change in activity. A salient change in activity here just means the output across this layer of the network has on average changed from one time step to another. Now, don't get worried when I say time step. The time step is arbitrary here. It could be anything. It makes no difference to what the model does or how it works. It's not based on the time step. It just has to change. Um, and we have, there's basically, the idea is there's a dynamic threshold. So when things at a particular level haven't changed much, it takes less to register a salient change at that level. So there's, there's salient changes happening at all these various levels of analysis in the deep network that are then sort of summed up. Uh, and when the combined changes over levels themselves exceed a threshold, a un we, we say a unit of subjective time has elapsed. That's our model of how people estimate duration, no clock just the rate of salient change across all levels of sort of perceptual analysis of a scene. Um, we, test, we tested that we recorded a whole bunch of videos across different kinds of scenes, divided them into segments, showed them to the model, it made judgments. You know, we, give it, we train it so that you know, it, knows, it knows what, a, like it has a reference of what a second is, but it's analyzing each of them separately. We also show them to people uh, and they make judgments as well. And we also gaze track while they're watching these videos. Now, what's, um, this is just an example of uh, one of the fun videos that we use. There it is. This is the Downs just outside Sussex campus. This one is a nice calming video. The red box is roughly where the gaze is centered when a participant watches this video back in the lab. That's the kind of video. It's very calming to watch a cow. Compelling. What we find then is, is this. So when humans make reports about the length of these videos, the longer the video, the longer the report, but you see these classic features of bias. So there's an underestimation of long duration and an overestimation of short duration. Um, these are the error sort of regions here. So there's these biases, but also there's a relation. So people are, people are judging time reasonably well. This is kind of logarithmic scale. When we show the thing to, when we probe the model, we see the same thing. So the model is making judgments, is judging longer things as longer, shorter things as shorter. And it's also showing these biases, but these biases are hugely overextended in this case. What's kind of cool about this model is that when we restrict the input to the model based on where people were looking, so we just crop the image to where their gaze was fixated, the fit is much better. So now we really closely capture what people, people's subjective estimates of duration simply by constraining the input to an image processing network based on where they were looking. If we shuffle, it gets worse again. So it's not just, it's not just the act of cropping that, that you know, reduction of the field of input that, that matters. Um, so yeah, the significance of this is it, it can, you know, we can get all the way from naturalistic input to a judgment of seconds that closely matches what people report without any appeal to an internal clock at all. And I won't go through this, but we can also sort of recover the biases that people exhibit for different scenes. So a busy scene, people will typically report as lasting longer than a boring scene where nothing much happens. And our model does the same. Uh, this is just a demo of it working in real time. So you can actually hook this model up uh, and wander around with it in real time. So this is always what people think is funny. This is the image network kind of interpreting Old Street Station as made up of turnstiles and shower curtains um, and various other weird things. 
Uh, but you can sort of see here that there's, there's the, this is a sliding window of actually elapsed time and the time estimate, the time that the model is estimating. And it's, it's roughly tracking it. So it's in real time, reasonably estimating time, um, just from perceptual dynamics. This was made last night by our collaborators Imperial on this project as he was going home. Uh, so finish this one and then I'm pretty much done, I think. Time perception is another form of inference on the causes of sensory signals. It's not just a readout of an internal clock. And duration perception seems to be well explained by an inference about the rate of change of perceptual dynamics. What we're now doing is sort of putting this in, in the scanner actually to see uh, what correlates you know, you know, can, we, can we use the model, can we do model-based fMRI of, our, of that model to see if we can begin to pin down the neural basis of time perception. So I want to just finish where, back where we started with, with self then. And I think one of the points that, that's come across is there's, you know, our experience of being a self is many different things. Even in the last few experiments, I've talked about intention and volition and agency and time. Um, we heard from Sarah about interoception and, and the bodily self. There's first-person perspective. And then at higher levels, there's Dan's narrative self. And of course, there's a the social self, the way we experience being a self through the perceptions and mental states that we attribute to others. Um, focusing on, on back to the bodily self, and I want to get here back to this basic pre-narrative um, idea of the experience of just being a body. And this brings us uh, to this other kind of motivation for or line that you can trace historically to active inference um, which starts in mid 20th century cybernetic theory Conan, Roger Conan and Ashby or Ashby before him this is a famous title of, of a paper people pretty much only ever mention the title and don't really mention anything else about the paper but um, it says every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. The idea here is if you want to predict, if you want to control or regulate something, you've got to be able to control it, especially if you want to anticipate perturbations and prevent them before they occur, which is particularly important in uh, physiological regulation. So Ashby's an early example of sort of regulation with his homeostat. But more generally, if we think about in regulation and control of the internal state of the body, we're thinking about predictive models that are geared not towards figuring out what's there, but geared towards controlling and regulating um, the, the, the inferred hidden states. So extraception, like vision, usually emphasizes epistemic active inference, inference to the best explanation, figuring out what are the causes of sensory signals. Interoception emphasizes something different. We perceive the body from within largely in order to control and regulate it, to keep it within the tight bounds that are compatible with physiological survival with staying alive. That's inference to the best prediction where best predictions are those which enable control and homeostasis under a broad repertoire of perturbations. So the claim, and this is, this is now, there is no virtual reality experiment for this yet, but the claim is that basic experience of embodied selfhood depend on these control-oriented instrumental predictive models of the causes of self-related signals. That's back to where I started. And then we can kind of make a more radical claim that the way we perceive the rest of the world, even our visual experience of the world, because it's all grounded in the same basic predictive mechanisms that originated in this requirement for physiological homeostasis. Well, they're all based on the same principle. The way we experience the world is fundamentally grounded in the same mechanisms that evolved to keep us alive and developed to keep us alive. So it's a kind of expression of this life-mind continuity thesis, um, I think, in a nice way. And this has a lot of echoes, of course, um, with, oops, sorry. So yeah, when we use predictions to figure out what's out there in the world, we perceive objects. And when we use predictions to, fig to control and regulate, the claim is, and this is something I want to figure out how to test properly, we don't perceive things as objects. We perceive how well or how badly that control is going. And that, I think, is a lot to do with this, what, why do you call the elusive phenomenology of basic embodied selfhood? Um, this has a lot of connections with people like Lisa Barrett's work, the EPIC model, and of course, Carl's work on the free energy principle, which is probably the maximal expression of this continuity thesis. Um, and yeah, we have this, this nice, very simple, very straightforward review of the free energy principle. Um, I will just finish here by going all the way back to Descartes. And Descartes, of course, was famous for many things, but he also made these claims that non-human animals um, although they, you know, they lacked souls, 
because, well, they lack souls. The fact that they were made of flesh and blood was no reason to ascribe them with souls. They were just beast machines, so we didn't have to worry about um, their suffering. Uh, he had a dog, but there we go. Um, the opposite perspective emerges from all this, that our conscious selfhood emerges because of and not in spite of the fact that we are beast machines. So it's a sort of inversion of that, that basic idea. So since we're in Edinburgh, um, choose life is the, the last slide. So I just want to thank uh, the people involved in the experiments I've shown, especially, as I said, uh, Keske and Warwick, um, other uh, colleagues and collaborators in Sussex. And um, just in the poster session, we have actually four posters from people from Sussex here, Lena Skora, Keske Suzuki, Manuel Baltieri, and Pete. So please have a look at those if you get a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you.